This hearing will come to order. Today's hearing is the third of the Senate Judiciary Committee that we've held since the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade, eliminating a woman's constitutional right to reproductive freedom. It was almost two years ago the court issued its decision in Dobbs versus Jackson. With a single ruling, the right-wing majority overruled nearly five decades of legal precedent and revoked a constitutional right for the first time in history. In the years leading up to Dobbs, we were warned about the dangers of overruling Roe versus Wade. Medical experts told us it would unleash a health care crisis across America. Legal experts warned us that it would establish a da disastrous precedent under which unelected judges can recklessly eliminate fundamental freedoms. And women across the country warned that overruling Roe would insert politicians and judges into the most personal decision imaginable, taking away their right to choose whether and how to expand their family. At the outset, I want to share a video on the state of our re reproductive health care system in the post dobbs era. And the Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade, that they have eliminated the constitutional right to an abortion. Well, I got rid of Roe v. Wade. Is it worse than you imagined? It's worse faster. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned 19 months ago, 21 states have established full or partial abortion bans. After stabilizing just enough to deliver our stillborn daughter, my vitals crashed again. In the middle of the night, I was rapidly transferred to the ICU where I would stay for three days as medical professionals battled to save my life. What I needed was an abortion, a standard medical procedure. The drug Mifepristone has been available to women for more than 20 years, used in more than half of all abortions in the U.S. As we sit here today, procedurally, everything's on hold, but this is a case that is moving very quickly, and I can ex we can all expect the Supreme Court to issue an opinion. My husband and I have been trying to expand our family for the last three years. Many of these people left in agonizing limbo, blindsided, after the Alabama Supreme Court shocked the country ruling that frozen embryos created during IVF are considered children. It was really crushing. Pregnancies are complicated and it's difficult sometimes to build your family. So it's really terrifying when that's left up to politicians and judges. Interceptives. Total ban. The fallout. Legal challenges. These anti-abortion laws. Trigger laws. Legal confusion. To ban abortion nationwide. The fallout of the Dobbs decision has been devastating. Women with non-viable, life-threatening pregnancies have been denied access to medical care, as we heard from Amanda Zarowski under oath at our last hearing. Amanda's testimony is seared in my memory. Forced to continue a non-viable pregnancy due to Texas's extreme anti-abortion law, Amanda developed sepsis and nearly died. Amanda's health care providers wanted to provide the abortion she needed. But we now live in a nation where health care providers live in fear of civil and criminal liability for simply doing their jobs. A nation where women suffering from miscarriages have been threatened with jail time and where access to FDA-approved medication used safely and effectively for more than two decades is threatened. In a nation in which just last month a state Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos, embryos are children under a state law which resulted in numerous IVF clinics in the, in the state halting their services. For those who desperately want a baby but struggle with infertility, for cancer patients who must safeguard future reproductive options as they undergo treatment, for LGBTQ couples who use IVF to expand their families, this ruling in Alabama was heartbreaking. Today we will hear from Jamie Hurd, one Alabaman affected by this decision. Despite state lawmakers' slapdash efforts to address the fallout after the Alabama Supreme Court decision, there remain significant concerns about the future of IVF in that state and others. Fetal personhood bills have been introduced in at least a dozen other states, and 125 U.S. House Republicans have co-sponsored fetal personhood legislation with no carve-out to protect access to IVF or birth control. And Justice Thomas showed us that constitutional right to birth control is at risk when, in his concurring opinion in Dobbs, he called for the court to reconsider its holding in Griswold versus Connecticut. More than 25 million women of reproductive age now live in the states where abortion is banned, 
unavailable or restricted, and women's lives are in jeopardy. Women facing non-viable pregnancies are being denied emergency life-saving medical treatment. Women suf suffering from miscarriages are being denied access to medication and procedures that can reduce emotional trauma and save their lives. Rape and incest survivors are being victimized by a system that makes it harder for them to end an unwanted pregnancy. Health care providers can no longer be able to use their best medical judgment to treat patients. And those who desperately want to become pregnant but need IVF are facing unnecessary bar barriers to parenthood. Those of us who believe in a woman's right to bod bodily autonomy need to step up and stop this chaos. We must respect women's rights to make their own reproductive health decisions. But the question remains, will our Republican colleagues join us in this effort and support legal access to abortion and reproductive freedom? 